Paul. And before Pete would let me sell Tatuaki, he made sure I could say it. Okay, <laughs> there you go. So good evening, everyone. Thanks for putting up with the cold weather, and hopefully we'll give you an hour and a half of fun with Pete over in Esteli, Nicaragua. Um, thank you, Paul, Anthony, John, and Mitchell for giving us the chance to take over the room. Tonight, guys, if you've got questions, put them into the chat room. We'll pick them up, and we'll give we'll, as we go through the evening, um, we'll get the, the questions over to Pete. As Pete was saying, he's in the, my father factory at the moment in Esteli, which is fantastic because it's a factory I've not been to. And um, who knows if we get lucky, we might see the My Father crew wandering behind and we might even get a chance to say hello to them at some stage. And how, we'll see how the evening goes, if we can get Pete to maybe wander into the, the rolling room. And um, yeah, so if I can ask you to put yourself all on mute like Alan... <laughs> and uh I'm not on mute. Hola Ricardo, I've just noticed you. <laughs> Hello Mitch. Hello. 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 Good to see you. Same here. I wasn't on mute, so they caught us both. But good to see you. <laughs> nice to see you. Welcome. And welcome everybody else on the screen too. Okay, sorry, Scott, back to you. Just being disruptive. <laughs> Scott, I think Scott's on actually, mute. Scott, someone actually asked uh, what cigar we're opening with. Well, we've got the two cigars tonight, Pete. We've got the number seven. Mm -hmm. And we have the 10th anniversary Bon Chasseur. So what would you recommend if people want to smoke both, sir? Well, I, I lit up the, the, the seventh uh, only because I love a Corona Gorda size. It's a classic five and five eighths by 46. And I think it's a good opener for the Bon Chasseur, which is a five and three eighths by 52, which everybody knows is a very classic uh, Edmundo size. So uh, I think it will be a good opener for that bigger ring gauge. Scott's on mute. Sorry, I'm going to have to stop touching my computer. <laughs> or some, um, the reason we picked these two cigars is because we launched... Actually, Tatuaje on the 7th of December in 2011, which I think, Pete, is your birthday. It was. I was actually in London for that. Well, indeed, with Jani. Yeah. And I remember meeting you at the hotel, and it was a freezing December night. And uh, we stood in reception, as you do, waiting for the lady to appear. And she appeared without a coat. Now, you probably don't remember, but I do, thinking... She still thinks she's in Miami. Yeah. <laughs> and uh, so we launched the, the number seven on the 7th of December, 2011. And the 10th anniversary is the latest cigar that we've launched of your range. So I wanted to go from the old to the new. Perfect. Us. Okay. So if I can ask Paul, um, people have obviously got lighting up their cigars. If you could tell us a little bit, please... About the Stalin do so we can get the, the spirits going as well, please? Yeah, certainly. So uh, Stella do is uh, our own Seagars Limited uh, range of independently bottled uh, single malt Scotch whiskies. Uh, the whiskey that we uh, have in the sampler uh, this evening is uh, the latest release. It's a single cask Glen Elgin. Uh, it was 10 years old uh, and it was bottled in November, December last year. Uh, the unique thing about this release is it's the first time that we've actually gone into a re-rack of a single cask within the Stella Do range. Uh, so that hence where the port would come from, came from in terms of the name of this, uh, this whiskey. So we, we purchased this uh, cask uh, of whiskies uh, when it was about seven years old and we continued to age it for another three years. And uh, through reviewing the cask, uh, we decided that we wanted to add a little bit more sweetness, a little bit more complexity uh, to the whiskey. So we actually put, we purchased uh, a first fill port cask and uh, we re-racked or we moved all the liquid in the original bourbon cask that the Glen Elgin was in and we put it into a port cask. And it sat in the port cask for about six months 
until we decided it was ready to to be bottled. So we bottled it just before Christmas um, and, and released it late last year. So everyone's poured themselves a little bit. Oh, it's delicious. So is this what you would call a uh, space side? Yes, it's uh, Glen Elgin is a space side distillery. Um, most of Glen Elgin uh, spirit from the distillery is actually uh, goes into the White Horse blend uh, whiskey, which is distributed uh, in 200 countries around the world. Uh, it's a distillery owned by Diageo, one of the, the biggest uh, whiskey um, drinks distribution company in the world. So you see very few bottles of Glen Elgin actually on the marketplace. And I think there's only one core range of Glen Elgin that they actually do, and it's very small in production because I think about 95% of the production out of Glen Elgin actually gets uh, put into the White Horse blended whiskey. Okay. okay. So, no, thanks for that, Paul. I'll come back and ask you a little bit, a few more questions about the, uh, what you got this? Staladu. I can say Staladu easier than I can do Tatuaki. I've been practicing all week. So, Pete. Yes. Cigars. I guess uh, you, you, you weren't born into cigars. When did you kind of first smoke your first cigar and how did it all kick off for you? My my first cigar was actually a very inexpensive, like, uh, drugstore cigar. It was a Bearing, if you know the brand Bearing, very old brand uh, here in the United States. And uh, Bearings traditionally were machine-made. I didn't really know much about cigars, in it, but as soon as I experienced the the relaxation of what a cigar did to you, I I went immediately to a true tobacconist, and I bought a cigar which was out of my price range at the time. It was two dollars and fifty cents, and it was a Pleiades uh, that was made in the Dominican Republic. I think uh, they probably call it Pleiades uh, normally, but uh, very mild cigar. But it was two dollars and fifty cents, and I actually felt bad for spending that much. That was premium back then. Scott's back on mute. <laughs> but I heard that it, it all kind of started when you were working in a strip joint. Uh, but, but I was trying to work out what your role was in the strip joint. Yeah, I was a I was a floater. I was the guy that would tell the bouncers to take care of business. Huh? Okay, I don't know what that is, but you know. <laughs> yeah, I was like the door guy that that called over the big guy to to help out. It wasn't my <laughs> wasn't my shining moment in in my lifetime, but uh, I needed a job. I, my first job was actually at a cigar store in. Studio City, California, which is no longer there. It was, at the time, was the oldest standing uh, cigar store from 1927, if I remember correctly. And uh, it was called Gus's Smoke Shop. They're predominantly a pipe store, and they would have a wide variety of great pipes, including great estate pipes uh, that we would find from a lot of the old celebrities that would pass away. And... Um, it slowly turned into more of a cigar store than a pipe store uh, with obviously the boom coming in. And that was in uh, 90, early 93. I was still 22 years old and uh, very green to the cigar world, but I learned a lot about uh, the industry and, and tobacco because I had my part of my job was to mix their pipe tobacco blends, uh, for the, the daily consumption that was coming in, because we sold a lot of raw pipe tobacco. I guess that's the opportunity where you, you get to read, research, and meet people in the industry, yeah? I met a lot of people. Uh, probably my one of my first per people that I met, uh, which we would call like a celebrity in the cigar industry back then, was Paul Gamarian. Um and I'm sure, I'm sure Mitchell knows who Paul Gamarian is. Paul Gamarian yeah. uh, has a cigar brand called PG. G, yeah. Very yeah. generous of his time. And then, then I started meeting, like, the great uh, factory owners like Carlos Fuente and Carlos Fuente Sr. and um, Manolo Casada. And it just, all the meeting, the great people, just took me on the rabbit hole even more. And uh, I realized that, you know, I came from a music background, a music industry, and I realized that the cigar industry was way nicer than the music industry. So 
I stayed with cigars. Okay. So I guess from that you learned a lot. So, but what then inspired you, Pete, to to cross that line from being a you know working in a cigar shop basically to creating your own brand or wanting to make your own cigar? What was the what was the moment, the inspiration behind that? So? I think the creativity part with music uh, really it stems from that. Um, you know, writing a song is like you know blending a new cigar, but I try to do it in. 1996, I went to the Dominican Republic, um, started talking with different factories and realized I, when I got back, you know, back to Los Angeles, I realized I really didn't know as much as I hoped to know. And um, it took me another, what would be that, another seven years to finally uh, make the jump. And that's the day I met uh, my father-in-law, who was my father-in-law now, not then, but the uh, that's when I met this guy named Jose Garcia that knew how to roll amazing cigars. He was still a new guy then as well in, in America. Yeah. Although they they had, had the reputation from, you know, from Cuba. He was yeah, still well, a new guy, I guess. Yeah. He, the family, um, well, Yanni was in the United States in 1997. Um, and through some, uh, work opportunities. Pepin finally made it to Nicaragua in 2001 and eventually uh, Jaime and Jaime's wife and, and Maria Pepin's wife came to Nicaragua in 2002 and in late 2002 they, they found their way into the United States and uh, I met them in early 2003 but yeah no one knew about him outside of Cuba and honestly he wasn't what I call Havana famous. Um, you know, a lot of the rollers that you would hear about in, in Havana were very well known. Uh, a lot of those uh, private rollers or or custom rollers that you would you would see at the factories in the front of the factory are like Rodolfo Tabuada or or even uh, think about Hamlet. Hamlet was one of those guys that you knew about because he was in Havana working. Pepin was in the center of the island, so I always say that he was never Havana famous. He had the opportunity to move to Havana but he, he liked being in his hometown and, and never left. So 2003, early 2003 is when I met him and uh, I didn't know who he was. And I had already been in the business by that time for 10 years. So, uh, but he still had no clue who I was either. He just called me some crazy kid with tattoos that, that uh, wants to make a cigar with him. So were you already making a cigar before you met Don Pepin? No, I was not. Uh, Tatawahe Brown Label, the, what we call the Tatawahe Brown Label, the tradition, the traditional selection the Casador line was the first line that Pepin and his family actually made uh, for full production, even before they made their own Don Pepin line. Oh, wow. So you kept yeah. them off then? Uh, I, guess. I, guess. I, I would say that the brand kicked them off, but okay. the, great, the great quality of what they made really shined in a, in the time of 2003 when no one was coming out with new cigars. Okay. So was he, was he rolling these, was he making these cigars in, in little Miami at the time? In, um, yeah, yeah. A small shop yeah. in little Havana. Uh, yeah. they, they had, when we first started, I think they had about, uh, five rollers actually. Pepin was one of them. Uh, my sister-in-law, Donnie, who is Jaime's, uh, wife, uh, she was rolling also. She's actually a wonderful roller. Jaime was uh, dealing with quality control and, uh, you know, packaging and everything. Um, the joke is around the family is that Jaime's wife was a better roller than Jaime. Okay. Is that still the Although case? Jaime's a great roller. Yeah, well, she doesn't sure. roll anymore, but I think she can still, she can beat him. Hey, okay. That's and uh, still friends, uh, a couple other friends that uh, still work with them uh, since day one. They still work in the factory in Miami now. I was about to ask that. You've still got a factory in Miami, but you make for the American market there? Yeah, uh, in Doral. They moved to Doral in 2011, which is, you know, Miami. And mm -hmm. um, so it's no longer Little Havana, but uh, they needed a bigger warehouse for their own production that was coming up from Nicaragua. And um, we make about 400,000 cigars in Miami every year for U.S. consumption. There are a few importers from different countries that, that pay the extra price to get certain products. The extra tariff, yeah? 
Yeah, there's a, I, I don't, they, a lot of them don't care. They just want to have uh, the stuff that doesn't, you know, that's not made down here in Nicaragua. They obviously are very low taxation countries, so they don't need to worry about the tariff. When you add it on to ours, then my God. Yeah, yeah, you're talking about uh, cloud and Switzerland and um, yeah, 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 a couple yeah. other places. Right. Okay. So working with this uh, fine gentleman, I guess he he's inspired you, but you've also inspired him. So what do you think he's learned more about learned from you? in the last sort of 20 years? Because people <laughs> well, don't I, that question the other way around. So I was trying to figure it out. Every, you know, Dumpy Pien's now held in such high regard within the, the industry. Well, let's turn it around and say, what's Pete Johnson inspired him to do? I think uh, maybe, if anything, I was, a, I was a classic traditionalist when it came to Cuban, uh, to Cuban cigars, to cigars in general, but Cuban cigars being what I really knew a lot about. Um, and I wanted to follow that tradition. And when Pepin came into the United States and met with other people around the country, they were always trying to get him to roll like this new style of, you know, new world cigars in the sense of, in the sense of like trying to copy a Padron or trying to copy a, a Fuente Fuente Opus X or making some outrageously strong blends. And Brown Label Tatuai was really focusing on old traditions of Cuba and Cuban cigars from like the seventies and the eighties when they were probably a little bit more stronger than they are now. So I think maybe sticking with tradition was probably uh, a big thing that I embedded in the family of like, you know, go with what you know, because that's, you know, you're, you're Cuban, you know, stick with that pride and, and be Cuban. Don't try to be anything else. And I guess you you came into the industry at a time when the other guys like um, the big guy um, Dion. Yeah, and there seemed well, to Dion be was a two thousand six. Actually, I helped yeah. Dion um, find his uh, find his foothold with a factory down here in Nicaragua. Okay, but it just strikes me looking back because I didn't come into the industry till about two thousand and ten. So when I came in, there was people like yourself. There was people like Dion. I guess there was maybe people like the Matt Boost the first time round. Mm -hmm. um, so there was like a, a culture of new young blood coming into the industry. Yeah, so, new young blood that didn't have any ties to to uh, families that, that had the history. But I guess you've come along a road with these guys to a certain extent. Uh, I don't know if you're all friends or whatever. but um, Yeah, we're all, we are all friends, actually. Dion, Dion has a shop in Reno, Nevada, and... Uh, He's still a very big client for Tatawahi, even though he has his own brands. But it, yeah, it just struck me that there's like this new generation coming through from the, the, the we call it New World Cigars in the UK, the New World Classics, but then the, the young uh, disruptors, I, would, I guess you would call it. Disruptors are probably, uh, probably a perfect name for us. Yeah, but I yeah. guess you're now, you're now, okay, you're younger than me, as you can tell. Um, but I guess you'll now get into that age where there's young disruptors coming up behind now. Yeah, yeah. Um, there's a lot of them actually. <laughs> no, there is. I try to give. I try to give them some of them advice, uh, whether they take it or not. Uh, I just turned fifty in December, so <laughs> you'll look forward. Now I'm now I'm getting to be an old guy. Well, we're, we're a generation apart, my friend. But um, no, that's brilliant. Listen, Pete. Have you got five minutes to take us for a walk? Because we talked about Miami. It'd be good to see the 200 pairs of rollers. That would be amazing. If you, yeah, if I'm going to... Well, they're back from lunch, so it's perfect. They're they're working. I'm going to put on my mask, and I'm going to connect from my iPhone. So if you see me coming into the room, please let me in. <laughs> <laughs> it's a disappointment if we don't. Yeah, I won't be able to smoke through the mask, so I'll just give you a little walking tour. I'll see you soon. Can I suggest you go to speaker view if you're not already. You might get a better um, view of what we're about to see if it works.
Scott. Hello. Yeah, can you hear me? I'm actually. Uh, yep, I can I hear know, you. I, I'm, still, I'm still connecting to my computer. Hold on one second. Let me go yeah. back in and, and uh, turn off my, well, my computer Bluetooth. Sorry, guys. So this is definitely live from Estelia. Yeah. So well, while we're waiting for, for Pete to come back on, uh, Anthony does have uh, some social media contests uh, listed in the comments. So post your social media photos of your cigars and uh, your Glen, uh, Stella Du Glen Elgin. And uh, you'll go into a draw to win a, a, a bottle of uh, the actual Stella Du Glen Elgin Portwood. Very nice, it is too. And if, if anybody has any questions, uh, drop them into the chat as well. Just while we are waiting, I'll just uh, talk about the social media competition. It's across any platform, Facebook, Instagram, or Twitter. Tag us in as many platforms as you can. You can enter as many times as you want. The nicest picture will win the bottle, so make sure they're nice and artistic and as fancy as possible. That, that would suggest you have a better chance of winning if you don't put me in it. Well, I wasn't going to say that, Scott, but... Mm -hmm. <laughs> I, I know my place, yeah? <laughs> all right, I'll superimpose you into all of the photographs. I, I saw a picture of uh, Pete when he was a musician in the early 90s. And I think he's got more hair on his head than I've ever had in my whole life. <laughs> Unbelievable. There we go. So apologize for this, guys. This is a live Zoom. Well, I'm hoping it works. If it doesn't, then we tried. We, we, at least they know we don't rehearse these things, Scott. <laughs> No, well, you, the thing is, the thing is, you can rehearse with. I know Ricardo's listening, but you can rehearse with Nicaragua, and it <laughs> might work then, but it might not work half an hour later. So, yeah, apologise, Ricardo. That's true. I think that's I think true. we have that in common with the Scottish, apparently, right? That's why we connect so well. <laughs> no, 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 no. I, I I made sure I put a pound in my laptop before we started tonight. Yeah. So, I apologise, Ricardo. But, yeah. Are you well, sir? Um, I am well, sir. Thank you. So good to see you. And so good to see so many good familiar faces that little by little have been allowing me to crash into these amazing events. Sort of welcoming a bit of the, letting me get from that diplomatic community to the community I love the most, the, the cigar community. So that's really, really nice of all of you. So thank you. Thank you, you so much. You send the bill to the industry every time, Ricardo. <laughs> okay, Sorry, finally. Oh. Oh, there we oh. go. Right. Finally, sorry about that. My my Bluetooth was not connecting, and then I kept on getting booted out. Let me see if I can turn around the camera real quick. So, we you can see, the very large room. But let me uh, turn this around. If I know how to do that, there we go. <laughs> so everybody here in. In Nicaragua works in pairs. If you notice, there's uh, one person bunching over here, and then one person rolling. Everybody here in Nicaragua uses pairs. Uh, that's pretty classic for Central America. In Miami, uh, all the rollers are actually doing it very traditionally uh, from start to finish. But uh, it's a full house, and everybody's wearing masks. This uh, this room is the main gallery. Uh, there's this wall over here with these big pictures on the wall. The, the Garcia's uh, number ones, number twos, and number threes. That wall is actually going to be torn down, and they are going to have uh, another gallery right behind there. So it's uh, pretty large. This is uh, Pepin and Jaime's table where they rolled a special edition cigar um, one year 
I think it was like 2010. But uh, the large spot, a lot of people. Any questions? You were saying well, I saw earlier, one. You were saying earlier, Peter, there's about five thousand people working in well, the factory in the fields at the height of the season. At the height of the season, in the gallery right now, I would say there's probably about four hundred people in the gallery uh, rolling. And do you but, have uh, se you have separate galleries for for different cigars or I, cigars right now? It's all it's it's all one gallery, and you know the rollers as, as they progress in their skills they move up towards the front of the room um eventually what jaime's plan is to build these other galleries to actually kind of section off certain things uh whether it be uh you know product that uh special edition miami stuff you know not miami stuff but special edition my father product or uh uh, this is always oh. a great sight to see. These are these are a classic uh, Leguito number one. You can see the nice little fan tail on there. But uh, yeah, eventually, Scott, we're, I think Jaime's plan is to have uh, dedicated galleries to certain brands. And yeah, obviously, you know, he makes products for um, Ashton with uh, La Roma de Cuba and San Cristobal. Mm -hmm. But I think you guys call it uh, La, La Roma de Caribe. And what's the other one called? El Paradiso. Uh, El Paradiso. Yeah. 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 Any questions? Any questions? And, and am I am I cutting off at all? That's the question. <laughs> no, this is fantastic, Pete. I think we're all kind of awestruck, actually. Um, and do the 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 the, the work in the pairs? Um, do you normally have um, a girl and a boy working together, or? Yeah, usually, I mean, if you can see, a lot of these benches are pretty pretty standard where there's a girl rolling and a, a guy bunching, but there are a few cases where there's a few guys that are actually doing the caps on the cigars. Okay. I'll take so you on a quick uh, detour yeah. out of so, the gallery. So would they like to use skinny monsters? Would they be made in here, your tatuaje, or would that be made in Miami? No, no, all the monster products are made here in, in Nicaragua. This is obviously the packing area. Huh? Another full house. Uh, grading, sorting for color shades and everything. Uh, they're, they're making a lot of cigars per day. I think, uh, I think they're probably closer to about 65,000 cigars per day. Per day? And yeah. Um, is that a six-day week or... It's actually a five full day, and then, well, speaking of, uh, well, that's my father, a five full day, and then Saturday, uh, they work from seven to noon, and it's really open for anybody who wants to come in and work. So this is all finished packaging. Yeah, it's actually, uh, I'll be honest, it's actually a little small compared to some factories down here in Nicaragua. There are some factories in Nicaragua that are doing over 100,000 cigars per day. Yeah, well, I've, I've uh, been in one. I've been in one peak with I've got eight hundred. Uh, speaking of uh, La Roma de Cuba. <laughs> yeah. Wow, and the 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 Don Pepin seventy seventieth anniversary humidor. Yes, that was made down here. Okay. That was made down here. And, and I guess it's only uh, the the rollers. The, the cigar, yeah, though that like where I was at the front of the room, uh, of the front of the gallery. Those those cigars are like those rollers are actually probably the best rollers in the factory, and they roll a lot of the specialty shapes, but also the best, you know, the most premium premium cigars. And you're talking about not just the not just the first couple rows. You're talking about the first ten rows at least that are rolling um, specialty items. So like, I guess my monsters would be stuff in there. How, how, long would it, how, how long would it take for someone to, you know, like a novice to start? If I came in the factory, how many years would it take me to get to the front row? I would say you probably thirty years, but uh, <laughs> some of these, some of these, uh, some of these rollers down here, they they excel within forty five days to sixty days. They 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 really learn their craft. But uh, to, get, to get to the I'll, front, I'll tell you. 
Yeah, to get to the front. And obviously the front gets different. And I think that's why that's why Jaime's talking about doing uh more uh you know more uh galleries because he wants to move more people that are that have excelled so much closer to those front rows. But I'll, I'll, let me show you something a little funny that so you guys understand. You see this girl here. I was just at the grading tables where you saw the, the bright lights where they were grading the colors and everything. When they're at the grading tables, so you can get an understanding of how the flow is. When you're at a grading table, all the cigars that are supposed to go in a box get bundled up. Like these bundles that are right here. And well, actually, these particular cigars, some of these are actually going in bigger bundles to age longer. But uh, if you see these smaller bundles, this is exactly one box worth of cigars that uh, a small box, actually, that's going to eventually go over to these girls in the banding department. And if you see this girl right here, she's they banded the cigars. Now she's putting them in cellophane. This is not the final step. This is actually far away from the final step so once it, it leaves this table right here it goes way over here to where you saw the florida las antillas boxes being packed mm -hmm. as my uncle <laughs> and these girls here are the final quality control step they actually empty out the boxes completely that were packed by these girls that were banning them and then they finish the box with all the stickers, the codes, like she just put a, a date stamp on all the boxes and you see the, the final sticker is going inside the box. Yeah. Wow. So, so Pete, the draw on the cigars are always unbelievably good. So there are no draw testers in this machine. <laughs> there are no draw testers in this factory. So how, how do you measure the, how do you do the quality? Do you do it by weight or, or it's, just it's, by... All, it, it's, it's all done by weight. It's all done yeah. by weight. And also, let me go back into the gallery so I can show you a little bit more. How are you bunching? Are you using sleeves? No, all hand bunched, uh, all into bar. So, very so, classic. So if you're not very classic Cuban. Okay, so if you're not draw testing and you're not using sleeves, so I don't understand how, how can you avoid having you know, a small percentage with draw problems because, I mean, I mean no. you know, the consistency no. of your cigars in terms of construction is quite legendary. So I can't... Don't, yeah. Don't buy weight. Well, you see this guy, you see this guy uh, wearing the, uh, the brown cape here. Yeah. These are supervisors for all the tables. Um, there's actually a supervisor for, I think, every uh, three or four benches. And... Uh, these guys are, you can see he's touching and feeling every cigar to make sure that they're they're not overpacked. Uh, if there's any flaws in the wrapper, he'll put it to the side or give it back to the roller to put a new wrapper in it. If the cigars are over bunched, they'll actually get destroyed. So yeah, no draw testing machines uh, whatsoever, uh, but it's all done by feel. And we, <laughs> as... As a brand owner, I pray that every cigar draws perfectly. <laughs> okay, so I, I get all of that, but um, presumably you must have some people actually testing smoking the cigars, um, and you must have some numbered quality control batches so you know if you've got a roller who's lacking a bit of dexterity and, you know, causing the odd twist that causes constrictions, for example, yeah. in the construction. Can I have that job, please? Yeah. <laughs> well, we smoke a lot of them. Um, and obviously, the, 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 uh, some of these, uh, the rollers actually get to smoke if they want to. Obviously, not anymore because of the, the situation. But uh, right now, they've been doing it mostly by feel. And yeah, uh, unfortunately, like a twist in the bunch is always that the mystery part that you can't see in a cigar. Absolutely. When, when, I mean, right. I mean, that's. It feels like the more cigar, and then all of a sudden, did I lose you guys? No, we got oh, you. It's all good. All good. Oh, we sorry, Mike. Yeah, no, I, I got you. Even though uh, every time I, I step near my computer, for some reason, wants to connect, even though the Bluetooth is completely turned off. <laughs> um, but you can hear me now, right? 
Yeah, yeah. Okay. Yeah, uh, back to the, the, the twist in the bunch thing. That's one of the, the – they could be the best feeling cigar ever. And then when you get the cigar, you uh, you try to uh, draw through it, and it almost feels like the the, uh, the breath of the, the cigar is actually going in reverse. That's the one thing we can't see by feel. But in the you know, old days before COVID, um, the supervisor, a lot of supervisors would actually be, be smoking cigars to test – to test the uh, draw on the uh, on the cigars from the bunches, we do have a couple of factory supervisors here that oversee uh, the people in the uh, the brown shirts, and these people continually go through and smoke different cigars to make sure that the draw is, is good. So yeah, Mitchell, to answer your question, um, we've been lucky. I mean, uh, we, we've had speed bumps over the years where where you know we've had draw issues and we try to we try to quickly uh, correct them and hope hope that not too many are on the streets. We did a very good job. Throughout, well, I mean throughout production again again the supervisors are checking by feel. Once it gets into the grading room, the graders who are at those tables, they actually check the 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 the, uh, the feel of the cigar to make sure that it's it's not overpacked. And then uh, hopefully everything is good by then because when it gets to the girls' banding, they don't really pay attention to that. But it's really about constantly smoking. Yeah, and, and, and the hey, worst hey, part is when I find a bad draw. I'm going to go back to the computer. Yeah, that was superb. Brilliant. That was superb. All impressive Galeria. Amazing. Uh, unbelievable. That's, that's the first time, Mitchell, I've ever seen a factory where they don't have a draw test or of some mechanism. Or what I've seen in other factories, they weigh the cigars as they're made. Yeah. Yeah. You know? So I've seen that in a couple of factories. And basically, if it doesn't meet the, the weight, it's discarded. Um, we have both in Peru um, at Tabacalera del Oriente, mm -hmm. where we make um, Inca. We have draw tests, draw master machines, and we weigh the cigars. And we still probably get, I would say, 5% of the cigars that we sell still have construction problems. And everyone talks all the time about plugged cigars, overfilled cigars, underfilled cigars. Rubbish. The biggest problem is twists. It's as simple as that. It's always been that way, particularly with Cuban cigars, but also the odd New World cigars. The, the, whenever there's a construction problem, I can tell you, nine times out of ten, it's a twist. You know, the, the roller just has missed that bit of dexterity that he should have had in rolling the cigar and there is a twist. And the only thing you can do is Desmond Souter taught me many, many years ago, cut the cigar in half, the twist is released, both, smoke both halves. Mm. <laughs> I like that one. Yeah. 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 <laughs> two, well, that's a Scottish cigar, two for the price of one. So, <laughs> I do it a lot with Cuban cigars, what can I tell you? Well, <laughs> I'll, 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 I'll say it out loud before anybody else does. So, um, Pete, I'll give you a break for a few minutes, if you don't mind, and I'm going to ask Paul a couple of questions about the style do, um, because I asked you the question about the inspiration, and this is a kind of Mitchell question as well. What inspired you to start doing the, the single malt, um, single cask idea? Because, um, you know, I guess like Pete, you, you work in retail, but now you're becoming a producer to a certain extent, Yeah. Is this a is this a pull or for me? You can either of you. What well, really well, inspired you to start doing this? Well, I'll jump in and say that Stalagy wasn't the first um, very successful um, independent bottle brand of whiskies that we have done, and it's it's my partner Ron's creation because he's the whiskey guy in the business, and he's got a lifetime of experience in the whiskey trade. Uh, we previously created two brands that were very successful, Treasurer and Dancing Stag, that we sold some years ago. And um, shortly after we sold them, um, Ron created the Stalladew brand because we have always been investing very seriously in single cask um, whiskies. Um, and we, we've had a rolling program of investing in casks for over 20 years now. So stuff that we bought 20 years ago that was seven years uh, oh, you disappeared. Hold on, you're back. One second. Oh, I don't know. Can you see me? Can you hear me? Yep. 
Yeah, yeah. I can see and hear you. Okay, so <clears throat> um, so stuff that we would buy typically like 20 years ago, um, and it was seven years old, it's very, very mature stocks now. So we, we've got a, a very deep stock of very valuable single malt whiskey casks. And, you know, since the first cask we introduced in the Standard Dew range, we've just kept rolling out another cask every month, two, three. Um, and the program has, has, has picked up pace over the years because we have such deep stocks and we're building the brand um, a, a, as we go along. And it's also alongside our core range, which is a space side and Isla and the cigar malt. So really that's the background. I, I can't take too much credit um, for the brand. It, it really all goes to Ron Morrison because he created just about everything to do with it. Although I did do the design of the cigar malt um, label. So okay. that's my, my sole claim to fame. How easy is it is to source the single cast, Mitchell? Uh, well, anyone can sort of reach out and buy a cask of whiskey. That's not terribly complicated. There's loads of people on the internet you can buy a cask from. The magic is, and the skill and the expertise is in acquiring, sourcing and acquiring a cask of merit and character and provenance. Now, that's a lot more difficult because there are very, very few people in the inner circle of the whiskey industry that have access to casks of merit and character. Um, and again, through Ron Morrison and his contacts over a lifetime in the business, um, he has those contacts to be able to source the finest casks, casks of malt whiskey. And, you know, the, the proof of that is not just me saying, well, I like it, you know, it's great. Look, here's his latest sample that he sent to me of an old Ben Nevis that we own that we're testing to bottle now from, uh, this is a 2013, it's absolutely delicious. But, you know, the real proof is the amount of awards that's Saladu has won in international spirits um, contests and challenges. And we've literally won so many bronze, silver and gold awards. Um, we are a very, very successful independent bottler of uh, single cast malt whiskies. So that's the proof is in the pudding. Oh, and do you do any export or do you sell it only in your own stores? No, we, we sell it in our own stores, a few restaurants, a few hotels and directly on our websites. Um, you have to understand that a single cask will typically only bottle 300 to 400 bottles. Um, so there's a very limited supply per cask. And so we keep it exclusively in house as much as we can. Are, are you allowed to divulge who you uh, get your cask from or is that a secret? Uh, I could tell you, but I'd have to shoot you, and I really do like you, so I don't want to shoot you. <laughs> I don't mind uh, being shot. <laughs> yeah, okay, okay. So I was going to ask the question, why don't you use, I'm assuming you, you know, there's probably going to be one or two famous names in there. Um, why you don't, you know, use their name on the branding as well? Well, we or do. do not need to? If you look at... Um, most of our single cask releases, they're bottled under the Staladew brand, but it will actually say the distillery it's from. So it could be a Staladew Ben Nevis or a Staladew um, Kaolila or, or, or whatever. So it's like a co-branding thing. So we own the cask and we can, more, most of the time, we're allowed to use the names. Occasionally, we won't know. And fucking skin. Uh, Richard, do you think you could go on mute, please? <laughs> yeah, I just put it on. Just to extend on that, uh, the, the, there's a couple, the, there's actually, I think, three single cask releases where we haven't been able to actually use the distillery name. Uh, that, that is the Sayosa, which is uh, uh, a Glen Farkless sherry cask, because they don't allow, they don't allow or give permission uh, for us to use their distillery name, but the majority of distilleries don't have an issue with you using their distillery name and there's some regulations in regards to sizing and how you can use their name but uh, the majority where we can we, we will actually mention the distillery name uh, as i mentioned so also is a glen farkless uh, we have a truth be told 22 which is actually a glen fittick cask it was actually a, uh, a ward head cask because what they do is they take the whole cask from glen fittick and then they put a teaspoon of Balveni into the into the into the cask, which then becomes not a single malt whiskey, and it's not 100% Glenfiddich. So it doesn't, the legislation or the requirements uh, from the Scotch Society doesn't allow you to then use the distillery name. 
Um, so that's why sometimes, like on the Truth Be Told, we'll say Truth Be Told 22. I mean, if you know uh, Glenn Fiddick, it's the valley of where the, dun- where the deers run. And we had that mentioned uh, on the label. So it gives some insight to the actual distillery where the whiskey has come from. Okay, so what's next? Um, what's next in line from? I've got to get it right. Staladu. What does Staladu mean? <coughs> black cliff, isn't it? Yes, black cliff. So the is black because you got the skin do. The black knife. Black cliff. So black cliff. Black cliff. Okay. And on so, the core core range, which is the the standards mm-hmm. Islay and Space Side, the label actually represents the black cliffs. Okay, so what's happening next with that? What what, what can we expect next from Stalladur? Who? Well, well Ron, Ron's constantly looking at the, the casks that we've got uh, in storage and we're constantly reviewing those casks uh, to determine whether they're ready to be launched, to be bottled, um, or as we did with the Glen Elgin, we'll, we'll, we may make the decision to actually re-rack that and put it into a... A sherry uh, into a sherry cask or a port cask to, to actually finish off the whiskey if we feel that it might lack some uh, complexity or or, or to, to add complexity into the whiskey. I have to say tonight's whiskey is absolutely delicious and for some reason you, sell, you sent me a couple of wee samples so um, <laughs> I'm, I'm doubly enjoying it. Uh, Karen's asked the question, why Black Cliff? Why uh, Scaladu? Paul, do you know the answer? No, I haven't discussed it with Ron, but uh, that's I'm, Ron's. I'm pretty certain um, that the answer is because Ron is incredibly artistic, to put it mildly, and um, a most prolific painter. I, I believe he did the most incredible, massive painting of a scene in Scotland. I think it was in Space Art or somewhere. And it was very black cliff. It, he felt very inspired by this painting that he did. So I think for that reason, he decided to call it Staladue. But it's also a good name because um, there's other old Scot- uh, Scotch whiskey brands like Dallas Dew is a closed distiller, isn't it? So, yeah. you know, it's it's kind of sounds like a good name for a brand of Scotch whiskey. That's great. And, uh compliments it's uh, very very good i hope i win tonight's competition <laughs> so the um, next thing for standard you is we've probably got to buy our own distillery and start to actually starting from scratch because we ne- we've now you know got a very successful independent brand so i think we'll probably either buy a distillery or start a brand new distillery and uh see where that yeah. takes us especially as we've got a good taste for it now that we're one of the owners of um snowdonia distillery um, in <laughs> Wales, which makes fantastic foragers gin and um, Ebet vodka, so we got we got the we got the bug for it really badly now. So I think that's probably our next move. Well, quite interesting because my little village here in Devon, as you can tell from the accent, is um, actually has a distillery in the old town hall, the Dartmoor Whiskey Company. Wow, I don't know if you've heard of it. So they've installed a still. They brought a guy from down from Scotland, and I guess I guess that gives it credibility that they've got a, a Scottish guy to give you a tour uh, of the the one still distillery, and basically they bought the town hall and oh. turned it into a whiskey distillery. So, which is why I managed to find this village to live in, which is pretty cool, I think. Yeah, in Devon. So in Devon. Muck so there you go, Mitchell. There'll be empty town. There'll be little town halls all around uh, outside London that you could probably turn into a whiskey distillery. I, th- I think we're more likely to buy in Scotland. <laughs> there you go. Interestingly, they have. They don't have the E in their whiskey. Can they do that? Uh, well, they shouldn't really, because I I think traditionally only uh, whiskey that comes from Scotland. Um, is without the E, and everything else is with the E. Yeah, that was that was my understanding. So, not oh, brilliant. So, Pete, you're back again. Hopefully, um, Mac, you got a little bit of information there about uh, Mitchell uh, Mitchell's. Whiskey. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Now I want to order some. Can you ship to the United States right now? <laughs> That's for you. <laughs> <laughs> Just send me your email address, and we got you covered, kid. Very cool. So, so, Pete, trends. I want to talk to you about blending and trends, if I can. 
Mm -hmm. when, I, when I come to the trade shows in America every year, one year it's everybody's going for a Connecticut wrapper or a Lancero or a small or a big Perfecto or double Toro seems to be the thing. And everybody keeps telling me this is what people are asking for. So, um, Nick, <laughs> you, could you move, please? Sorry. <laughs> Um, so when you're looking at your new launches, your ranges, is it scientific, Pete, or is it just a case you sit around the table and say, this is the range we have, what's missing? Or how, how do you go about picking uh, what you're going to do next? Yeah, I, I think it's a little all over the place. Um, as much as we listen to the consumers, um, we don't really follow the request of like, what they want. We didn't really jump on that, that giant ring gauge thing or the really gigantic and long and fat, uh, 80 ring gauges. Um, at the end of the day, it really, it's about us being able to enjoy the cigars that we make and we make the cigars for us first. The bonus is when everybody else enjoys them. So I, I stick to, to the traditional stuff mostly i do have a, a couple oddballs in the group but uh, i try to steer towards the old the old school mentality and, and i love the old cuban vitolas so i i try to find uh, people that have mold you know that produce molds uh that i can buy to to fit like an old cuban vitola like right now uh, i'm releasing my third culebra i've done a culebra over the last uh I think 10 years now, uh, I've done two different versions. It's called Old Man and the Sea. So in every box, you have one straight cigar and then a Culebra of that one straight cigar. And th this year, we're doing the Fausto version, which is actually a pretty full-bodied and strong cigar. And, and I guess there's a, there's a kind of... You've answered my question. Like, if you like it, you think everybody else will like it. So, do you think? Oh, well, that's a hope. <laughs> it's not always. Right. Okay. It's not always the case. Okay. Because I came, I came out with a very mild version, uh, a brand called El Triunfador, which is not really, really mild, but uh, very classic and traditional. I would say it's a medium minus in strength, and uh, and I used all the old Vitolas. Uh, that I could think of that I wanted to use. Like I love Cervantes. I love Marebas. Uh, I love uh, Petit Coronas, you know, traditional old school sizes that, that I think are, are kind of long lost, especially in the American culture. And I'm hoping that a lot of those come back, but we're probably one of the largest producers of, of uh, Lanceros or what you would call a Leguito number one. Uh -huh. Um, uh -huh. We we probably have just in Tatuai, I probably have over thirty different Lanceros, a classic seven and a half by thirty eight, with the yeah, little uh, Lancero yeah. head to it. Well, you even did a limited collection box, didn't you? With ten different. Um, yeah, I saw that. Yeah, yeah, I actually have two different versions. I have a monster right. version of that, yeah. and I have a, a regular version of that, okay. and then a yeah. lot of regular production Lanceros also. It's it's a crazy thing. The the the, the Lonsdale, the San Luis Ray Lonsdale was like Frank Sinatra's uh, smoke, and um, it's really fascinating because we had um, in our portfolio we had San Luis Ray for a little while because um, Habanos, I forgot to trademark it in the UK, so it was quite fun. But it was really interesting. So a lot of people talk about the Lanceros and the Lonsdale, and say how it's a fantastic smoke. But of the whole range, that was the slowest seller. Yeah, yeah, yeah. and it, it was also the best tasting one. Yeah, yeah, yeah. But for Absolutely. some reason, it was <laughs> it was it was the yeah. worst seller because I think I think Cervantes yeah. in general have lost their the nostalgia for Cervantes has gone away. I love them. I mean, I try to put a Cervante here and there in, in most of my lines, but it's always our least popular. Yeah, and that's the same with our experience as well. Whenever we've brought in a range and we've experimented and said, right, we'll take that. It creates the most noise, or it seems to create the most noise, but it's the slowest sales. So it's really yeah, bizarre. It, it makes a lot of noise, uh, especially with with uh, what you would call a cigar geek or cigar nerd, mm -hmm. which I am. Uh, a lot of the guys with the bloggers and everything love those classic sizes, but mm -hmm. 
when it gets to the retail store, it's the, it's the last one to get picked up. Absolutely. Absolutely. So Robusto tell me- Toro Churchill and, and, and Mitchell, yeah. maybe you can, yeah. you, maybe yeah. you can chime in on this. Have you seen lately like the decline of torpedoes and, and pyramides or even bellicosos? It seems like consumers are steering away from the, the Figurato head and it's just strange. Well, I can, I can tell you from our sales stats, um, you're absolutely correct. Um, Campanas and, and Pyramides popularity has declined quite substantially in the last 18 months. But you'll probably be quite shocked when I tell you that Prominentes, double coronas, sales yeah. have gone to the roof over the last year. I've never seen anything like it in my life. And I can't understand yeah. why. Because it's very yeah. strange. Because if I go back two years and further... We wouldn't sell a box a week, but now we probably sell about 10 boxes a day, which is fascinating wow. to me. I think it's because people have more time. I think so. It could, it could be a whole lockdown thing. You know, it's just gone a bit crazy with big cigars. Uh, I mean, also Churchill's, you know, Jodiata Dos are selling like absolute mad. But still the most popular size for us, I would say, across Cubans and New World cigars is Robusto's. And, yeah. and, and the least popular is, is definitely Cervantes, which I think is a crying shame because it's a very elegant size. It's a very delicate size. Um, it's a very decadent size. And it's a gentleman's cigar. But as you yeah. said, a lot of people make a lot of noise about them, but they don't really buy them and smoke them, which I find fascinating because I smoke them all the time. I'm yeah. actually just about to release a what we what we call the uh, Alonsdale Extra or Cervante Larga, which is, which is still the 42, but it's six and three quarters in length. And... Uh, and it's making a lot of noise because everybody in the United States that follows the brand wants them. Um, because I, the original batch that we made was a small batch of 70 boxes. This batch is a thousand boxes, a lot more, but it's one of those cigars that everybody's, uh, everybody's, uh, freaking out about and they want. So I'm, I'll be happy to, for the consumers to get into those smaller ring gauges. Uh, I, I like the smaller ring gauges. I mean, I smoke a lot of Moravas myself. Um, and I think you just get a bit more intense flavor because of the smaller format, in particular the smaller ring gauge. So for me, 38 to 42 is a really intense smoking experience, more so than me chugging on Robustos or Pyramides, big ring gauges, you know, lots of loose flavors. I like a lot of intensity um, some of the time with, with the smaller format cigars. But I think uh, I'll tell you, one of my favorite sizes is a Mareva. Um, I think. Uh... I'll probably retire with a, a Mareva in my hand because I, 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 out of my whole collection, I have probably have more Marevas stashed away than anything. When, They're just a, you, it's just a classic gentleman cigar. When, when you're blending and to train new blends, what, what, what Vitola do you use? <laughs> I usually go into it knowing which Vitola is that I'm going to have in the line. And I, I don't like particularly go for one Vitola to, to try a blend out. I tell them to make every size because I want to taste every size in the line in that, in that blend. And that way, if there's anything that needs to be tweaked, we'll tweak it. So ultimately all cigars end up being their own unique blends because you, you start with a base, but when you start shrinking or going fatter, you have to adjust to give it its own, its own, you know, identity. That's, that's always the challenge scaling up and scaling down the blend because it's not quite a mathematical or scientific equation. You can add what you think is the right percentage of Viso or Lajero and find that the expression of flavor simply does not show through how it did it, when we do it on the, on the sample size, which is quite fascinating because you think it would be quite, you know, scientific, but it doesn't always work like that. Well, Mitchell, I'll give you an example. Um, we double bind everything in the factory. So every, every cigar has two binders. So every cigar that the Garcias produce in the cigar, uh, the Garcias actually have two factories here. One factory called T- uh, Tabacla or Cubana or Tacuba um, makes lesser expensive, more bundle style cigars uh, that we can afford to bring out to the market at a cheaper price point. And then of course, in my father factory, and then in Miami, uh, we have the, the factory there. Every cigar has two binders. And 
I we had a brand called Negotiant, which uh, is basically what we are. We're Negotiants. We come to a great factory, and and we we have a, a great factory make us products that we that we want to put our brand name on. But um, one of the binders in Negotiant is actually Mexican San Andreas. And in the larger ring gauges, like the 50s and the 52s, and even the 48s, um, like in the Churchill that we do, um, the blend worked perfect pretty much in every size. But then when I made a small 46, like Petit Corona, the blend was overpowered by the same priming of the San Andreas. So we actually had to lower the priming of the San Andreas to marry it with the rest of the product. Yeah, makes sense. How, how much contribution does the um, double binder give to the flavor of the cigar? Uh, I, I would say it, it, it really helps with just complexity and, and different flavors that, you know, I don't know percentage wise, but uh, it just adds a different layer to the cigar. I mean, Cuban cigars have been double bound for a long time, obviously. Uh, I think it adds a lot of flavor uh, complexities and then, I think really a good part about double binding is it really holds the bunch together well and you get less risk of uh, expansion and popping of the wrapper. I don't think there's much uh, flavor contribution on binder in a Cuban cigar, not, not in the same way as on uh, New World cigars. Yeah, I mean, all binders are, you know, there's always one neutral binder and one, one uh, binder that's a little bit more aggressive, but uh, they're pretty you know, lower on the priming scale anyways. Yeah. Um, a lot of times that we find, if we, if we find a blend um, that we like, we smoke it without the buy, without the wrapper to make sure that the blend is complete. And then the, the wrapper is the crowning achievement. You know, that's the, that's the extra layer on top. Um, we actually did that um, in the Davidoff uh, tasting and blending masterclass in the, uh, Dominican Republic years ago. It was quite fascinating with wrapper, without wrapper. Yeah, I'll tell you, some, sometimes you get a cigar without the wrapper, and especially if you're looking at a higher priming, richer wrapper, like a Connecticut Broadleaf or a Habano Ecuador from, you know, high priming, uh, you find that the blends are actually pretty neutral tasting. There's not much going on until you, you add that wrapper. Yeah, uh, but we try to make sure that the the flavor is all in the bunch and the, and the uh, with the binders before we add that wrapper. That's why I like playing with similar similar blends and showing how much the wrapper can change the blend. So, Scott, if you remember in the seventh in the mm -hmm. seventh, we actually what we're smoking is Habano from Ecuador, mm -hmm. um, and it's you know a higher priming Habano. But we also use uh, Sumatra from Ecuador on another okay. version called the Seventh Capa Especial, and then yeah, we, yeah. we do Seventh Reserva, which has broadleaf. Yeah, and uh, it's a good teaching machine because it shows a consumer how different the cigars can be. But then, in the end, it it really develops their palate, and they can figure out which one they like better. Yeah, I mean, we 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 import both the Reserva and. Uh, the normal cafe number seven. Yeah. So we got, yeah. Okay. Same really insides, just a different wrapper. I want to talk to you about um, hand rolled. Yes. Please. Okay. I was very lucky a couple of years ago at the IPCPR to, you know, those big tables where you go for lunch. Yep. So I went and got my hot dog and my, <laughs> my small Pepsi that I could have swam in <laughs> and sat down and there was two young guys there called Jesse Marriott and Steve Gerabin. Have I said that mm -hmm. right? Mm -hmm. yep, and they started exactly. to tell me all about this story, this movie they were making called Handrolled. Yeah? So I felt quite humble because just sitting listening to them, I had no idea what they were talking about. Oh, sorry. We, we, uh, we have a surprise. <laughs> Hello. Hello. How are you doing? Yes, how are you doing? Good. <laughs> Good. <laughs> You've got to translate me. <laughs> do you think? Do you think uh, your dad back? Yes. Can he come and say and wave uh, hi? Yes, absolutely. Uh, okay. okay. And maybe your brother too, if he's available. All right. Cool. <laughs> so, 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 Pete, you were one of the producers and funders of this film. 
So can you just tell how you got involved and the objective of it? I don't know if the guys in the room know anything about this hand-rolled movie, but it's it's worth hearing the story, please. Well, when Jesse and Steve approached me, they, they were actually at the trade show. Wow, I want to say it dates back to 2016 or 17, maybe. They're at the trade show, and they were afraid to come in the booth to talk to me. So I saw them standing outside the booth. I went and talked to them. Mm-hmm. And they pitched me the idea of a, of a – oh, there's Jaime. Un saludo a todos. Hello. <laughs> How you doing? Say hello. How you doing? He's good. He's good. Healthy. Awesome. <laughs> awesome. Oh, here's the real. Ah. Ah. You remember Scott? Well, no. <laughs> <laughs> Never heard of him. Hello. How you doing? They say hello. <laughs> He's happy as a pig and uh, pig and shit right now because he gets to be in, in his favorite spot. So. <laughs> huh? Fantastic. Absolutely. Yeah, the limited amount of travel. He he just got his second vaccination uh last week. So oh. he, he's uh he's happy to be down in the middle of all this tobacco and uh I mean the 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 expansion that they're doing here is 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 crazy. He's just um I think he's been to the same farm five times in two days. <laughs> wow. wow. But he's happy. But uh, yeah. yeah, no, they're 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 very happy. So back to back to Hanrold, um the in- initial concept that Jesse and Steve had on it was about uh, the FDA fight. And I thought that was kind of limited to where the story needed to go. And I, I love wine documentaries uh, like Psalm into the bottle or um, red obsession that Russell Crowe actually narrated. They're just educational. And you get to hear stories from the people that make the product. And I thought there was a lot of great stories uh, to be told from the people that make great cigars. And I told them to watch those wine documentaries and said, I need something like this, but the more you show me, the more I'll be into it. And uh, they started filming and I, I gave them a little bit of money. And every time they'd show me a little bit of footage, I would give them more money to the point where they named me executive producer. <laughs> um, <laughs> but for me, it was always, I mean, the story is about, really where cigars went when Fidel Castro took over the island. Um, you know, that's why we still have the, the Cuban culture in there, but uh, it's really what happened to a lot of these great families that had to leave Cuba after the revolution. And I think it, the timelines and the way you watch it, it's, it's really cool to see. Um, and it's educational. And you get to hear great stories from, from the producers. Um I, I was proud to be part of it, uh, but Jesse and Steve did all the magic. Nice young boys, I have to say. And um, so, anybody in the room, it's on Amazon. I think AJ's put the link on there. Um, you get it on Amazon Prime for nine pound. I think it is eight ninety nine. So you can you can get it. Watch it. Honestly, if you want to learn the history, really of cigars through the, I guess, from the late 60s all the way through, the history of the Padrons and the Fuente, it's, uh, it's a great thing to watch, it's, uh, it's a great thing you've done, Pete. But uh, I, I thought it would be a great way to uh, educate the world mm-hmm. about cigars, but uh, Jesse and Steve said that uh, when they were, you know, putting together, their, their main theme to the whole thing was to if people were to watch this, they want they want the, the non-smoker or someone that might be living in a house that with a smoker, but they choose not to. They want they wanted people to understand that cigars are not cigarettes yeah. and that it's a different culture. And a lot of people that I know have told me stories about how they they sat their wife down to watch it and they're like, Okay, I understand why you love cigars so much. No, absolutely. So talking about the difference between cigars and cigarettes, that's a really good link. Um, let's talk about the, the PCA, the Premium Cigar Association, and uh, the Cigar Rights of America. You're a very, uh, you know, what's the word I was looking for? A keen supporter and advocate for retailers in America, particularly. I saw yeah. last week on the, the, the PCA um, that you, you know, you, I'm a member of the PCA, by the way, Pete. I hope you're impressed. I know, I know you are. I don't know if you can see that on the camera. So Pete donated ten thousand dollars 
So I was waiting. I'm hoping to get my check later on for. Uh, <laughs> but I mean, that's I'll tell you, it, it, that's it started. A, it started a little movement. Uh, movement. Uh, mm, a couple I other people that. have already joined in. Um, actually, a very small producing uh, brand owner uh, chipped in ten thousand dollars also, and we're we're actually hoping we can build up uh, their reserves a little bit so they have more money to fight all the state legislation because. That's where really the PCA has been focused on the state stuff really well. The CRA has been focused on the federal battle. And right now the federal battle has been pretty quiet because of all the transition that's going on. Um, we got a nice little victory in September of last year, which helped us out a lot, but we still have a lot of fighting to do. And um, the CRA um, has a pretty core group of supporters. There's about 14 companies that continually put in a lot of money to the CRA to help fight uh, the federal battle. Uh, we're hoping to get more um, participants because I always say that you shouldn't be riding. If you're, if you're selling cigars in this industry, you shouldn't be riding off the coattails of Arturo Fuente and, and Padron and my father and myself or any of these other companies that put in, you know, Robbie Levin's a huge, actually Robbie's the, the chairman of the board of the, the CRA. These are the Rocky, you know, Rocky is probably one of the best parts of the industry. Really good with the, uh, with uh, the federal battle, uh, great on camera too, which when it comes to the federal battle. So, uh, you know, Alan Rubin, uh, Rocky, George Padron, the Newman family, the Fuente family, the Garcias, myself, and a few others are are really funding the federal battle right now. We're hoping to get more people involved. That's fantastic, Peter. Well, I saw the gesture to, I mean, really aimed towards bricks and mortar guys as well, isn't it, to help them? Because yeah, I mean, COVID's affected the bricks and mortars more. The online guys have done pretty well, I guess. Yeah, someone someone actually said the other day, like they thought that business was booming and, you know, people are selling more cigars, but it, it, the internet is kind of like taking over a little bit because of their accessibility to the consumer level. Mm -hmm. I mean, when you search on the internet and you need your favorite box of cigars, there's five companies that come up right away. Yeah. And those, those small brick and mortar stores, they might have a website. They're not going to show up on that list anytime soon. Um, so it, it was really important to make sure that the state associations have a little extra money to, to battle some of these things that are coming up. There's even amongst this, you know, small mini boom during this pandemic, um, you know, there's multiple companies that are backordered completely on cigars. They don't have enough to produce. Uh, they don't have enough tobacco to produce. The, uh, the states are still, you know, all the anti-smoking groups in the states are still going after you know, raising tobacco taxes, um, putting restrictions on certain types of tobacco to be sold. I know some counties have outlawed pipe tobacco sales, which I don't understand. Um, but I think, you know, the American market, obviously we use toppings on, yeah, your on our pipe tobaccos. A lot of the flavorings in America we can't use in this country. Yeah, exactly. So, I mean, but I will say that probably the English style blends, um, in the United I, States are yeah, probably more they, popular. But they can't get enough of them, Peter. You know, yeah. I've got my friends up in uh, Kendall, the Gowth guys, they ship to America and it's sold out within a week. You know, they just can't produce enough. And um, which yeah, is non -top a non-top tobacco is a, it's, it's pretty popular. And, and I think it's really nice to see because a lot of, you know, younger people that start smoking pipes when they're younger, they, they go straight for, you know, for the vanillas and, what are the cherries and all that stuff. But when they experience an English style blend, they go, Oh, this is what pipe tobacco is supposed to taste like. Supposed to taste like. Absolutely. Yeah. Absolutely. But no, I think what you're doing with the, the retailers and the CRA is unbelievable, Pete. I mean, we, Thank you. we try, we, tr we try our best over here. Um, but you certainly have a, a very coordinated approach in America, um, which is to be applauded. So listen, today is National Drink Wine Day. Did you know that? Oh, I'll tell the girls. They'll be happy. <laughs> yeah, they'll be very, very happy. So I'm conscious that, you know, time's moving on. And and obviously you also have moved into the wine industry. Well, and not not really. Well, no, I was no, never I'm, in the I'm wine gonna, industry. <laughs> I'm going to quote you from the cigar aficionado. 
So you reckon you bought some uh, your first barrel in 2011, which you said was a bad year. So you're going to have to well, leave it for 10 years. So it's now 10 years. Okay. So I'm giving you an excuse to open. Okay. The, uh, the 11. Okay. Well, according to the Bordeaux uh, culture, 11 was not a great year. Um, it was a, what they call a classic year. My, my wines uh, that I did were actually made uh, in Bordeaux. Eventually uh, the, the organization was bought out by a very famous chateau called Lynch Bage, and they still make wine for private clients uh, like myself. But um, my first trip to Bordeaux during that interview from Cigar Fish and my first trip to Bordeaux to do the 11, I actually ended up uh, making 2010s also. So I was able to get a hold of some 2010 juice, but uh, I my I love Bordeaux wines, but I'm a little when it comes to the wines that I did, I've only done five vintages uh, from 2010 to 2014. Um, my blend is very upside down. It's all right bank. It's uh, all San Emilion juice. Um, I don't have a designation of San Emilion because now the bottling is done in Poyac, so now it's just a Bordeaux superior. Um, but it's upside down in the sense that traditionally in San Emilion, the blends are higher in Merlot and lower in Cabernet Franc. I decided to turn it upside down and do higher percentages of Cabernet Franc and more Merlot. So I actually have more Cabernet Franc in my blend than uh, Cheval Blanc. <laughs> and where is your wine? Is it in France or is it in America? No, it's all in the United States. And there's a, there's a case of it down here in Nicaragua. So I'll yeah. be drinking some tonight. <laughs> yeah, you do that, please. You do that. So... Ricardo, are you in the room? I am, sir. Yeah. So, um, Pete, I don't know if you've met Ricardo. Ricardo's the deputy ambassador for Nicaragua. I we did on the last herf. We should have um, we should have introduced him to Don Pepin. I'm so sorry. I missed that. No, I missed no. that opportunity. So, Ricardo. Um, Thank you, thank you very much, Colin. Uh, Pete, yes, absolutely. I think it's. I think it might be the third event that I had the pleasure to hear you attend and, and somewhat connect with you. I, and I still can't wait to hopefully get a chance to do it in person. Um, and I didn't know the seventh of December. I mean, I think that must have been in your stars one way or another, in Nicaragua, because by now you would know, right? How seventh of December is such an iconic date in the Nicaragua. Yeah. It's, it's for some people, they celebrate the 8th of December, um, the, 8th, the Virgin Mary and the conception of Christ. Um, but it has become a much bigger thing in Nicaragua, as you've known uh, in cities like Leon and many others. So one could almost say that one way or another, that was already painted in your, in your path. Um, one thing I wanted to say, um, Mitchell, every time I go to your events or I meet with you, you always, I always learn something else you're getting yourself involved or developing. It's mind blowing. And the latest, I have to say, it's incredible. I mean, having your store now in St. James, can't wait to visit that one. I do hope that we can create enough demand for New World cigars, but primarily, obviously, Nicaraguan cigars and tatuaje cigars, that little by little, we can, we can start moving aside some of the other cigars that take a lot of the space of that beautiful store of yours particularly this year, because this year is a very special year for, for Nicaraguans and for those who've made Nicaragua, Nicaragua their home, like, like yourself, Pete, in many ways, like your family there. It's the 200th year of our independence. So we're hoping that little by little we can earn through the man. Um, and I'll do it, everything I can on my side to, to little by little make some space there, Mitchell. So once escape that push, that, that diplomatic push and commercial and demand push, so hopefully we can we can get some of that. Um, we have some great Nicaraguan cigars, even in our new store. Um, and as you know, we have quite a few stores. I think we've got eight, nine, ten, including whiskey stores. And we have an enormous representation of Nicaraguan cigars generally in our business. And it's, as you know, it's a very, very important category for us. And we are fully supportive, as Scott will confirm. And we're pushing Nicaragua all the time because we love the product. Absolutely. So it's not a complaint. It's just a, a showing love 
and wanting more of that. We can never get enough of your support. Everyone in this industry that cares about the UK market knows you're the you're the man to work with. Um, but Pete, one thing, um, hearing you speak today, I had a couple of questions. I know I won't get a chance to, to ask all of them, but there were a couple of them too, at least, that I would love to, to bring up. And one, I love I love your cigars um, and, and I love the brand. I love that connection sort of inspiration that you get from literature. So the, the old man on the sea, so you get Hemingway in there and you have the Foss by Goeth. Um, and, and then, but when you talk about the musical side of it, um, the other day, I was talking with a blender, um, well, who wants to be a blender, and I kind of started diverging into the topic. In an actual event, I made an analogy, which may be really wrong, so I want you to put me right in case I'm wrong. But we're comparing sort of the blending between more, let's say, Cuban cigars and New World cigars. I mean, the way the, way the conversation was going is as a, as a master blender, say, if you're the musician, the head of the band, and, and you have... Cuban cigars, in many ways, you can build up to a, a great monologue with the best aroma in the world. You can maybe do a duo, a trio, maybe even a quartet of flavors within what you can play with and the different tunes and music and melodies you can play with. But when you go to Nicaragua and the New World Cigars, as a musician leading that, you can almost have an orchestra of different flavors because then you obviously have different terroirs not only within Nicaragua, right, because you have the north, but then if you want to bring a bit of ometepe and make it more volcanic, and then you can go really wild, I suppose, I mean, and, and pick things from so many places around the world. So would it be, would you feel that way in many ways? So with, um, with New World Cigars, you get that opportunity to perhaps in terms of flavor, have more creativity and more instruments at your disposal or not necessarily the case? I mean, what do you feel nah, about that? I mean... I think it, it goes with any country that produces cigars. Um, there's always regions that, you know, the tobacco from different regions are sp uh, for specific parts of cigars. Yeah. Um, even with Cuba, you, you want you want great wrappers. You try Pinar del Rio or Havana. But then if you want filler, you go into the center of the island to, to Las Villas or Villa Clara area where the, the soil is a little richer and it, it produces great filler tobacco. Um, it's very similar with, with Nicaragua. We have four different distinct areas uh, that we use. Mm. We don't use Ometepe, mm. but um, we have um, Jalapa, mm. obviously, which is more refined. It's more about aroma and flavor from Jalapa. And then Esteli, which is more about volcanic soil, and you get those rich, dark flavors. And then we have another farm that's kind of like on the verge of being in Kundega, which gives a whole different dynamic. The Garcias have one other area that they, they pretty much, they're, well, they're the only ones out there cultivating, and it's in Namani, mm -hmm. um, which is just out about 30 kilometers outside of Esteli, and it's in its own little valley. Huh. And that's where they grow most of their shade-grown tobacco. Mm. And... From last year to this year, the, uh, I've seen their shade grown probably tripled in size, and you just see a, a valley of cheesecloth. It's really, really beautiful to see. Um, but even that area is so unique because that's kind of a cross between, I would say, between Jalapa and Esteli because of the, it, because of it's in its own little valley. But how about when so you I think throw in a Mexican and an Ecuadorian and a Nicaraguan tobacco? So the mix of origins, that's when you take it. That's yeah. I was, maybe I was talking a little bit more along those lines when you can not only blend with the same origin, different terroirs with one origin, which I love what Pepin and you guys, everyone does with these Nicaraguan puros, which are amazing. But when you can, boom, open the bubble and say, you know what, I'm going to get a bit of Cameroon and a little bit of Ecuadorian and San Andres and Nicaraguan. So that kind of orchestra I was referring to more. Yeah, it gives you that opportunity to, to show uh, the world uh, even more of your talent. Um, you know, when musicians decide to change genres slightly or go into a different genre, it, it gives the opportunity to show the rest of the world that they're not, you know, a one note uh, champion um, or a one note songwriter. So when you bring in those other countries, it makes it even more interesting. And yeah, I mean, there's there's cigars that we have that have three different countries in it. Um, there's cigars that we traditionally, I mean, we, we pretty much mostly make, uh, Nicaraguan puros, but a lot of the, a lot of the wrappers that we use end up being from Ecuador. 
although with the Garcia's growing so much shade grown product, uh, a lot of these blends that we're coming up with lately, we're able to show uh, what a true Nicaraguan Puro in our, you know, with classic C Cuban blending, still with that classic, you got to go as much as, you know, you, you don't want to talk about the Cuba side of it. Th it all stems from there. So you have to pay attention to the history before you end up making a great cigar anywhere else. Um, so yeah, th th adding those different countries really adds that, uh, it, it, it adds a different layer to the product, but it also, uh, or a different note to that song. Yeah. Uh, maybe a different chord progression, I guess. And, um, uh, yeah, it's, it's nice to play. I always say though, if you just, if you just made cigars out of Nicaraguan cigars. And I say this in the documentary, you could make thousands and thousands of blends. Hmm. So it's really about finding the ones that hit your palate the right way. Again, it goes back to us making cigars. We make them for us to be happy with first because if we're not happy with it we just don't make it we, we go on to a different blend and that that comes through i think as, as you said like once you you learn the artistry you learn the musicianship and if you keep with that analogy from the cuban essence of it absolutely i think that that's what carries through in, in your cigars and that's amazing now Thank i want to skip one question and move to to the future um some of the things you were talking about was about you know these newcomers and and you lending some of your advice and into uh, into the future of how they're coming into the business. But in a more bigger picture, you know, when you're looking into what's ahead for the industry, um, are there any things that you would love to see more of, um, that you would like to see more, yes, happening in, in whichever direction you would like to do, be it in terms of the branding, in terms of the construction, production, whatever it is, but someone who's been there, you've been with some of the best in the world. So there must be certain things that you would say, you know, I would love that, we were doing more of this or people were getting more into that or we're missing some opportunities here within that bigger picture. Well, could you share some of those things um, that I, I'm really curious and would love to hear? Well, I mean, I, I follow the path of the people that taught me. Um, the old guys in the industry, a lot of them are long gone, like Carlos Sr. or Orlando Padron. Th these, these people were super, super generous with their time and I, I got to listen to them a lot and and just make sure you follow a path of tradition. Uh, my my biggest problem with this industry in for the future is that the more and more people that come into the industry, they forget about the traditions of the of the industry, and they they forget about. My big thing is truth in marketing. You, if you can't if you can't speak truthful about what you're putting into a cigar, and you just want to be a brander that's branding marketing only. I think it hurts the industry because you need to rely on the history to move forward. You can't just, you can't just look forward in this industry. You have to look to the past and you have to be honest about what you do and you have to be truthful about what you do. Again, one of my pet peeves in this industry is when we're talking about, you know, we're very open with, with what wrapper we put on the cigar or, or what we might put in one of the binders. We, we like to tell those stories, but when I hear someone talk about a new rapper and they just say it's Habano Rosado, that doesn't tell me anything. That's, that's a color, you know, Habano is the seed, but it's Rosado. You know, what, what seed is it? You know, is it, I mean, is it Habano Rosado doesn't tell me much, but if they say Jalapa Rosado, that tells me even least, you know, less. Jalapa Rosado is, is a region and a color. So tell me the seed varietal. Tell me that it's, you know, Habano Ecuador or, you know, whatever country it's from. Tell me uh, if it's Criollo 98 or Corojo 99 or Corojo 2012. Tell me those things because I think education is, is very powerful for cigar smokers. And the more the, the consumer knows about what goes into what they love, they're going to be even more attracted to go down that rabbit hole and find those things and and understand why they like cigars more over other cigars that's really really interesting to hear and i guess in many ways that's what key will keep it alive right not losing that connection to where it all started from and not getting too lost into all this this interesting and creative things right i mean they have certain value and they and then it kind of maybe some some creates a it opens the ears to more people to want to learn from but not losing that 
he's something very simplistic about it in many ways. Something so simplistic. I mean, the history is the key. The history is the key. I mean, obviously, we need marketing. We need social media. And I think that's going to help carry a lot of these brands forward that are coming up. But I want them to pay respect to the history um, because that's that's your teaching tool. You know, that's the that's where it starts. It is. And well, if, thank you. I don't want. If you just want to be a brander and a, and a marketer, this is not the industry for you. Got it. Got it. But I don't want to monopolize the questions. But I just want to leave you with the thought that a um, couple of weeks ago, probably probably a month or so ago, I met with um, with Glenn Glenn Loop and Josh. Um, we're really excited about you know PCA was coming and and, and as um, Scott said, in my view, as you know from a government point of view, I think it's it's our responsibility to really not let that fight be fought just by the industry, not by the trade, not just by the retailers. And that's something that Scott knows here, and Mitchell knows, and anybody else who knows us here working. And you know you have that support, and we're going to be learning for all this stuff that you're doing in the U.S. I had great conversation with Chris and Edo and many other people who have been very much in depth in the whole challenges because we're going to be facing lots of challenges even more here in the UK as time goes on. But rest assured that we will be paying attention. At some point, we might knock on your door and get some of the advice that we need to also support what Scott's doing and everyone here in the industry is. But that's something that I, I, I would not never uh, think that that's something we should put just on the a burden on the producers, on the makers and on the retailers. I think governments, especially producing governments, um, producing country governments, we need to be more and more supportive um, of everything that needs to be done to protect the industry, which is, is, is essential to us and essential to, to the consumers here in the UK as well. I, I agree. I mean, it, we can't, um, we can't just, I mean, it's, it's everybody's got to get involved. Everybody. If you're, if you're passionate about just being a consumer of the product, uh, make your voice heard of why, you know, cigars should not be banned or outlawed. Or um, I think it's important that, I mean, We'll pick up the slack when it comes to the, the money part. I mean, and and paying the, the the really huge legal fees that we have to pay to our lawyers. But uh, but um, I want to hear voices from everybody, and that's really where cigar rights started. Was supposed to be more of a consumer base, but it ended up being you know predominantly manufacturer you know funding. Um, we just need more people involved and make sure they make people aware that cigars are are not an addictive product. They're not, uh, they're not something that, that people, you know, have to have and, you know, go on a, on a 20 minute cigarette break or whatever it is, or 10 minute cigarette break. Um, this is, uh, something people use to relax and enjoy life. And it, it's completely different than what, uh, the big tobacco is. And I, I like, I like people talking about how, you know, we should, completely try to separate as much as possible from those from those big companies those big tobacco companies because that's not us this is a boutique small industry Indeed, and I, I i hope i hope that the countries get involved more and the ambassadors of those countries get involved more speaking with politicians that they know because it's really important to explain to those politicians that these countries without cigar producing uh could hurt very bad so. Absolutely, absolutely. But you have a you have a friend, diplomatic voice here, um, and I hope that we can we can decimate and, and infect in a good way others to, to continue that. But thank you so much for for your answers, and a pleasure to see you every time. Thank you. Good seeing you, bro. That's a great subject, Pete. We could probably spend another hour talking about it. Um, we do have our own organisations in the UK, split between importers and retail. Um, so importer-wise, we've we've been more independent. I know a few years ago, um, when we had all the labelling issues uh, between Mitchell, uh, Hunters and Franco, and ourselves, we kind of broke away from the mainstream to fight that. Otherwise, we'd have the same problems as France and other countries like that have got now with their labelling and designs. Um, so we've, we've we've had more wins of late. But we're very fortunate that we now have somebody like Ricardo. And I think, if I'm correct, Ricardo, Nicaragua is looking after the Central America, is head of the Central America group at the moment, which means they can start pulling the Hondurans and the Costa Ricans and uh, helping to fight the cause. So Ricardo has been a great supporter. Um, we are political we, level of what we are. 
I Thank think you. clarify on that one. Just so yes, yeah, so what happens in Central America every every six months a country takes the chairmanship of the eight countries that com that constitute the the European Union of Central America that includes the Dominican Republic as well. So we just pass it to Costa Rica and they do have good cigars. Let's hope that they keep the momentum that Nicaragua started, um, but doesn't matter. We'll keep on the fight as well um, here with, with you, yeah. I think my fear with Costa Rica is they have such uh, strict anti-smoking laws. Like there's really nowhere to smoke in Costa Rica. Yeah, they're, they're a lot more challenged, and, and I think they'll be a little bit more timid into how they will approach it. Um, but I think we can still have a lot of encouragement and, and having countries like Mexico being more involved as well. They have a bigger leverage sometimes because of the bigger um, trade power that they have across everything else. Um, so I think there will be there will be good battles, but we have good allies. And with people like Scott and Mitchell in the spearhead of it, um, I think it's our responsibility, and it's good to hear. Yeah, when whenever the, the bills come in, we'll, we'll we'll help share those. <laughs> but but Pete, um, I guess we're coming towards the end. Uh, listen, I apologise. Uh, I haven't paid as much attention to the chat room tonight because I've been fascinated with the conversation uh, we've been having. Hopefully, you guys at home have enjoyed it as much as I have. Um, Someone did ask the question about um, how would you break into this industry? How would you recommend, Pete, for someone to... I mean, I came in at your age, okay? I I, uh... I, I, I say I matured into cigars because I worked in the big tobacco industry for 30-plus years. So so I, I say I, when I grew up, I moved into cigars. So, But if you're a younger guy trying to break into this industry, how would you recommend they went about it? I, I always say that the, the best first thing you could do in this industry is start from scratch and go work for a, a fine merchant of tobacco products and, and learn why people buy cigars and, and why, uh, you know, different cigars taste a different way. It's really important. I mean, I, I was blessed that I had 10 years before I actually started the brand to really kind of understand retail. And now on this side of it, I'm actually able to, to help the retail side. But I, I've come very close. You know, everything's very tight in my mind when it comes to when I put a product out, a price point, making sure that the retailers, you know, have uh, good margins on it. Uh, whether, whether or not the boxes are, are shelf friendly. Yeah, those are all things that come to my mind when I put stuff together. And I think having that background was very helpful for where I, for where I am now. So I always say, start with that because you'll learn a lot, a lot, and you'll meet a lot of great people and then let that bug hit you. And then eventually uh, you'll have to start traveling down to uh, these countries and, and visiting factories and, and try to convince someone in a factory to make you a product. Yeah. Yeah. It's, it's worth doing the trip just to convince them. And then even if you get knocked back, you can always go back again. Um, I wouldn't say no to go to Nicaragua tomorrow. I tell you. I mean, I'll tell you once these, you know, once the world gets back to normal and we're all able to travel again and, and have these festivals that, that are going on every year. Um, I always recommend traveling to one of the festivals because you'll learn a lot there too. I endorse that. So, Pete, what's on the future? What's the future, sir? You're still a young man. <laughs> yeah, you've got it all ahead of you still. So, yeah. I, you know, constantly uh, trying to, uh, to to create, really. It's it's really about finding something new. But uh, concentrating on on full production products is is the key for me. Making sure that the product that we make every day is the focus and then – and throw a splash here and there of, of the fun stuff. But, uh, you know, I just want to, at the end of the day, I just want to make a good cigar. And, uh, and, and the praise, you know, and you pray every day that people enjoy it too. Well, listen, Pete, it's been a fantastic, um, wow, hour and 45 minutes. That's the longest uh, night I've done, actually. And it's gone like that, certainly for me. Well, you're, you're old, so that's why. <laughs> <laughs> no listen Pete it's been an absolute pleasure I love being in your company it's great to hear your stories there's a lot of stuff we could have talked about tonight but 
Um, we'll have to get you back to talk about them. Um, Mitchell, Paul, AJ, have you got anything you want to add? Um, Just add my thanks to Pete for joining us. Um, very interesting, educational for me. Uh, we love your cigars. We're very supportive of the brand. So thank you for joining us. A very good Thank you. Event. Hope to meet you in person for a smoke one day after this madness of Corona has ended. Scott, well, thank you as always. And, and Ricardo, thank you for joining us as always. Mitchell, I'll say that I'll be in London before you come this way because I, I need to get out of the house. <laughs> <laughs> we do as well because we usually spend about half the year in the USA. So you, I might beat you there. You never know. <laughs> but yeah, Pete, thanks very much. Best to Janie. She probably couldn't look at the screen and see whoever he was. She's probably just looking at her. No, I because I, I only saw. Guys. Yeah, she saw you. She saw. Uh, she saw a group, but I. That's, there's that's three why she ran. That I'm that's seeing. What, so. That's why she <laughs> ran. Ah, but um, no. Best of the family. Thank you so much thank for you. tonight, Pete, and we look forward to doing this again another night, sir. Thank you. Well, yeah. Scott, thank you to everybody, and thank you to everybody that actually uh, joined today. But uh, without the consumer base, honestly, what Scott, what Mitchell, and I do uh, has nowhere to go. So. Uh, Thank you for being a participant and thank you for supporting all of us here. Appreciate it. Over to you, Paul. Much appreciate to everybody that joined us this evening. Uh, go to the website, look up uh, the future of virtual hearths coming up. As Mitchell made reference to, we're doing uh, forages with a Cuban cigar in a fortnight's time. Uh, Anthony has posted the social media contest. So post your your, your images to any of the platforms and uh, we look forward to seeing everybody in a fortnight. Thanks, everyone. Thank you. Thank you very much, Paul. Thanks, Ricardo. Thanks. Take care, everyone. Bye-bye. Cheers. Bye, Bye guys. Everybody.